Hello there and welcome back to another episode of the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast with your hosts, Mr. Laz Michaelides, and on the screen opposite me, Mr. Felipe Amorim. How are you doing, bro? I'm doing great, man. Hello, everyone. Excellent, excellent. What's been going on in your life? Anything different or just still gigs and lessons? Yeah, same thing. Just more gigs and more lessons. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite about you, man? Living hmm? the dream, paying the rent. No. Exactly. No? Yeah, yeah living exactly. The dream, living the, the dream and paying the rent. How are you... Is you still still staying out of trouble? All good, yes, yeah, yeah. You can't get in trouble when you live in the country. It's impossible. There's just no one to get in trouble with. <laughs> Man, we could we couldn't have uh, um, more um, contrasting lifestyles, isn't it? It's fantastic, isn't it? And do you know when we when we set up this podcast? Do you remember the the introductory paragraph I wrote about us? I said a seasoned Brazilian drummer and a young British bassist. So you've got three contrasts there. Seasoned, young, British, Brazilian, drummer, bassist. <laughs> so, and now you've got another one. Now I should add to the description. One lives in Soho and the other one lives in the countryside. <laughs> so that's exactly. exactly. But we, we have the love for rock and roll as a common thing, isn't it? That's the, that's the bond. Exactly. That's the bond. And to further that bond, we are doing another album today. We are doing... Uh, Rising by Rainbow from 1976. Um, now, before we started our episode, you just told me that you actually hadn't heard this album before in full. Let's do things a bit sort of unusually and just tell me straight away, what were your thoughts on it, having heard it for the first time? Well, that's the thing. I mean, uh, uh, just to um, clarify that, the thing is, loads of the classic rock albums, when I started listening to them, um, it would be like after school, and back in the day, uh, for people who are used to streaming and all that stuff, back in the day, we actually had to buy CDs. <laughs> and it was kind of expensive to buy those CDs in South America. So basically, you would go to a friend's house and listen to whatever CDs they had. And, and they would come to your flat and listen to your CDs after school. And that was it. That was the experience. Like you, you sit down and listen and enjoy the music. <laughs> so I, I, I was a big Deep Purple fan. So... Through that, through uh, Deep Purple and Black Sabbath, obviously, I I, I ended up listening to Rainbow. But I, I think I've the, I first listened to the Best Of, and uh, not many of these songs from this album are on the uh, Best Of, if I'm not wrong. Mm. And um, yeah, so the, the whole album, start to finish, that was the first time, and I'm really, really impressed because I, I yeah I, I didn't I don't know what to expect. I, I think. The most interesting thing for me was it sounded unexpectedly groovy. Yeah, for, for a heavy yeah. rock album. Yeah, you know? it's like like the, the the first song has a four on the floor. You know, we talked about four on the floor before, which is common in blues and disco and loads of music genres. Which is when you have the kick drum playing every every beat of the bar. Yeah. And it, it does have that, which is very unusual for heavy rock songs. Mm. Like from the beginning, you have that groovy vibe. I, th I think it's really, I think it's going to be really interesting because I'm going to approach this. Uh, I'm going to get my 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 history chops out, and I'm going to approach this purely from the heavy metal side of it because this album is so important in the development of heavy metal. And when we get to that stage of the episode, I'll talk more about it. But straight away, you've identified some disco stuff, some bluesy stuff in it as well. And that is something that's really good about this album. Like I said, when we get to talking about the metal, I'll go deep in it on that. But what else are you hearing in this album? You've already said the four on the floor and the bluesiness in it. I hear hints of deep purple in there, early deep purple. Yes, you do have it. So, uh, Obviously, uh, Richard Blackmore is the essence of the early Deep Purple albums. You know, yeah. as he as he was he was the guy who would come up with the riffs and all that stuff. Um, you have a, a really interesting change in the theme uh, of, of lyrics because you have mm -hmm. Ronnie James Dio as, as as a songwriter as, as the main lyricist. If I'm not wrong, yeah. Um, so whilst in Deep Purple we have songs about fast cars, attractive girls, and you know chaos and mayhem and booze. Typical, like, um, very silly rock themes, let's yeah. put it like that. And and they would admit it's very silly. Um, they, they've done it in interviews. And with Rainbow, you have more, like, uh, mysterious women and a bit of maybe a bit of black magic, a bit of, uh, uh, you know... I don't know some medieval kind of vibes, well, I don't, exactly which is it. which is more typical of heavy metal. When when you go back to to the purple, that's classic rock. They were not approaching these kind of uh, um, 
those mysterious like themes and 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 historical stuff that that um uh heavy metal bands would talk about like iron maiden does a lot of that yeah and um in fact the last song of the album reminds me a lot of iron maiden yeah it really does um there's actually two heavy metal subgenre uh subgenres that this album is credited with maybe not out and out inventing but at least pioneering and innovating and the first one of those is quite ridiculous because i only ever heard it i only ever heard of it when i was discussing this album and that's called castle metal <laughs> and that it's it's purely <laughs> it's ridiculous isn't it yeah it's purely about the lyrics and what it means is it's fantasy fantasy and medieval lyrics um, you know, talking about dragons, kings, princesses, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that's the first one. And that can be any kind of metal music, but the lyrics have to be fantastical and be about sort of fantasy based. And this is what we get here. You know, Tarot Woman, that's a woman who um, who reads your fortunes. And, you know, a lot in a lot of movies, if you have like a... Um, the character goes and sees uh, uh, someone who's going to tell him his future or something. That's what it reminds you of here. Run with the wolf. I'm not thinking that's a metaphor for anything. I think he means literally running with a wolf, <laughs> you know, because that's what that's what people do in movies, isn't it? Well, then you've got sorry, go on. No, no, no. When I was listening to the albums, the, the images that would come to my mind is exactly like castles and 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 exactly, yeah, uh, and trees and mountains and stuff like that. So <laughs> it, it, it does. Uh, set the scenery really clearly with with, yeah. with the lyrics, doesn't it? It does, and the the most important part of this of, the, of that lyrical discussion is when we come to the last two songs, "Stargazer" and "A Light in the Black," because lyrically it's fascinating. "Stargazer" is about a wizard who enslaves humanity, not all of humanity, but a lot of humans, and he forces them to build a tower so that he can get to the top of the tower and get closer to the sky, you know, to gaze at stars, obviously. And once that song finishes, you move to the next song, and the lyrics are almost a sequel of that song, because it's about the wizard dying and falling from his tower, and it's about how the humans, who were once in his control, are now free. And I just thought, for 1976, that is really cool. Like, you know, we've had concept albums 10 years before in Zappa and the Beatles and Beach Boys and stuff, but and this isn't a concept album. It's almost a concept half an album. But I just love it that it's like a story, a fantasy story, just in those two songs. Well, and those are the, the longest songs in the album, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's like a, a, a 33, 34-minute album, something like That's that. That's right, not, yeah. It's not really long. And those two songs together, they they take about... Probably seventeen half minutes. Of it. Yeah, of like, <laughs> probably half of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 quite it's quite long. I mean, and it's interesting because they have very short, uh, a, a straightforward like uh, rock songs at the beginning of the album, and then yeah. and then they have those two long pieces at the end. Is is as if they found the formula by the end of the album. I don't know if they wrote the songs in that order or yeah. if it's just designed to be like that. That'd There's an interesting, interesting thing know. about I think about the lineup when you when you think about it. Because the original Rainbow was Dio's band, wasn't it? He had a uh, um, a band called Elf, uh, yeah. and basically what happened was when Blackmore wanted to start this project, which was originally labeled as Rich Blackmore's Rainbow. That's right, Blackmore's yeah. Rainbow in America, especially because yeah. he was a big name in the industry. So he pretty much recruited the whole band, this band Elf, and. But obviously, he had realized that Dio was the actual like uh, bandmate he needed for songwriting and everything else. Yeah, and then they sacked the whole band after the first album because you know uh, Blackmore is, is famous for being uh, excessively demanding with musicians. Maybe this kind of perfectionism is what makes him uh, a great songwriter. He's a bit of a controversial character. Um, not many people were happy to work with him. You know, mm. and um, but he's a perfectionist, and, and that's part of his genius, isn't it? That, yeah, that's, that's, you know. So I think those two guys, as the main songwriters, they needed to be in charge, like like totally, and they needed to have people that they they could actually trust. And Cozy Power Power is the the the, uh, the biggest addition they they made to the band because it's such an iconic. Uh, um, heavy rock drummer one of the best in history you know still mm. celebrated to this day as one of the best heavy rock drummers 
and uh, uh, as you can as you can tell by the the epic drum intro in Stargazer, isn't it? It's like this. There's a uh, uh, and it's funny because there's a double time kind of vibe for the drum intro, and then it, and it goes half time when the vocals yeah. and, and everything else starts. So it, 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 I think they were looking for the ideal lineup, and they found it. And um, it's it's important that by changing the band, that's not Dio's previous band anymore. That's a new project from this album onwards. So yeah. it, it it does give them the I think the creativity or the creative freedom they needed, and I think Dio became more of a st- storyteller from this point. I guess. You know? Well, you, when you get new band members and you get new ideas, don't you? New fresh perspectives on things. You know, um, if if you're in a band where. You know, you're right. If, if if Blackmore and Dio wanted a bit more control and they were with that other band and that other band were used to all working together, all five of them putting in ideas, taking a decision to a vote, uh, do you want this solo in, yes or no? You know, but if Blackmore and Dio had to be the dictators in this scenario, then, you know, maybe like, you know, get guys in who could add musically what they needed, but actually would just say, listen, you guys write the songs and lyrics and we'll just play what you ask us to. Yeah, exactly. And, and Blackmore is famous for being a guy who would direct the band and tell them exactly what to play. Right. And he was, you know, a, you know, as I said, really demanding. He, he really knew what he wanted. And um, there's an interesting thing, though, I think, in his playing. I think he, he he's so comfortable with his guitar playing this album. I... I expected, to be honest, when you when you suggested this album, I expected loads of guitar shredding. That was what I had in my mind because that, that that's Richard Blackmore's Rainbow. That's his. Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably the first project he was actually leading, and I thought, well, you know, he's gonna he's gonna just like uh, show off and and play all his <laughs> all his chops in every single bar of every single song. Yeah. But in the end. There's loads of melodic guitar solos, bluesy vibes, and like bends and long notes. And he alternates. I think I think he alternates that with classical music and fast phrasing, which is what he was famous for in Deep Purple. Mm. And it, I think he found just the perfect balance between long uh, notes with blues feeling and and the fast classical music phrases. I think he found a perfect balance in the album, and none of the guitar solos are just um, are, are just there to show off. Really <laughs> wanky, as we wanky. Said. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to put it in a you know with more polite terms. Yeah. I love the fact that you just say it right. Yeah, we can, wanky. we can. Yeah, it's our podcast. We can do what we want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so just as usual, little quick bits of information. So yeah, uh, the album is Rising by Rainbow, released in May 1976, recorded in February 1976, and genres associated with it, traditional metal, heavy metal, and hard rock. Length comes in at 33 and a half minutes, and it was produced by Martin Birch. Rainbow at this time, as Felipe said, were a new lineup. You have Ronnie James D on vocals, Richie Blackmore on guitars, Tony Kerry on keys, Jimmy Bain on bass, Cozy Powell on drums and the sixth band member, the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra. Yes. Now that's where I want to talk. That's where I want to go next because you said already the the classical influence. Now, this is a huge factor in this album because, again, I'm just I'm itching to get to the heavy metal section, but I'm just trying to compose myself. It's like, all right, lads, we'll okay, get there. But it is, it is a heavy yeah. metal album. But, man. Just... but before we get there, it's really important to, to know that. In, in the early 70s, we've done episodes on this. We've we've got prog rock flourishing. You've got Yes, you've got Genesis, you've got Emerson, Lake and Palmer, all taking rock instrumentation and adding classical elements, making songs way longer. You're talking going from three and a half to four minutes to 18, 20 minutes. And you've got extended solos, hugely classically influenced. Um, complex arrangements, instrumentation. You know, bands like Yes, they get orchestras in to do some um, musical section on their albums. Um, and you have to wonder, Black Richie Blackmore loved classical music, and he was hugely uh, enamoured and encouraged to. Well, well, he learned the classical stuff on his guitar. He loved playing it, and that's like you said, where it came in in with Deep Purple because Deep Purple are one of the early, early heavy metal bands. Not that they would class themselves as that, but in terms of some elements of their sound would go on to influence later generations of heavy metal. But there is a fantastic balance in Deep Purple 
between the classical elements, as you said, and heavily reliant on the blues, which is obviously where where rock evolved from, uh, especially in America and Britain. So you've got Deep Purple there with this fantastic balance of blues and classical, but with a huge rock bass, you know, B-A-S-E. Um, and I just love the idea that Richie Blackmore, after a few Deep Purple albums, is kind of looking across and saying, well, hold on, look at these guys in Yes, and look at these guys in Genesis. Why, why do they get to take 30, you know, 13-minute guitar solos? Why can't I do that? And I love to think that he has brought some of that influence here, especially with the final two songs, Stargazer and A Light in the Black. I, I think, yeah, I think like uh, heavy rock and hard rock bands were looking into what the prog rock guys were doing, for sure. For listen yeah. to Black Sabbath's uh, 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 Volume 4, I think yeah, that's the album they had. Uh, uh, some like longer solos and mm -hmm. and like and and the addition of keyboards and it, you, you can clearly see that the heavy rock bands were uh, stealing uh, good ideas from from prog rock. And the thing with Blackmore specifically is it, he he had so much talent and so many technical skills. He could play anything, anything that has yeah. that there was um, a part of rock and roll or classical music at the time, and he was pretty much the uh, the first famous, but if not the first to do it uh, for real, of course, all the people were doing it, but the first like kind of big name uh, in guitar, the big name in rock music, who who added classical music to rock and roll and made it work because you can't just do that for the sake of it. Uh, but he made it work. And with Deep Purple, though, those solos, those classical solos in the middle of a song talking about how fast you can you can drive your car and <laughs> and how much booze you can take in a weekend, it's in, well, which Deep Purple is one of my favorite bands of all time. Okay, But I'm saying, like, it seems to me that, that that's the one thing I didn't expect. It seems to me that the, his guitar playing is even more suitable to the songwriting uh, uh he was doing with with Dio, mm. then you know. It, well, th naturally they go hand in hand, don't they? If you if you kind of put the fantasy classical element with, uh, sorry, the fantasy um, medieval element with blues, you don't really, I mean, you wouldn't ever link them, but you would link that fantasy uh, medieval element with classical music. Um, not entirely sure why, but I just think naturally the first thoughts in my head is that they go together. Um, sticking with the classical elements and heavy metal. Uh, I said already about the castle metal um, subgenre that this album influenced. And another uh, subgenre of heavy metal that this album has supposedly innovated or pioneered is power metal. Now, um, power metal, let me tell you some characteristics of power metal. Uh, you've got fast paced songs, lighter and more uplifting in terms of feel, but still heavy. A lot of fantasy lyrics and themes. Uh, more importantly, symphonic and classical orchestrations added in. Now, power metal love doing that, either via adding uh, orchestras or by playing orchestral instruments on the keyboard. And then from power metal, you kind of branch off and you've got symphonic metal, opera metal, all that stuff. Anthemic choruses and much larger emphasis on the keyboards. Now, the reason this is interesting is because in Europe, in the 60s and 70s, and I suppose the 50s to an extent, whilst in Britain and America, blues was coming in and taking over. You know, we had John Mayall and his blues breakers and that, you know, all these blues artists that were coming from America um, and performing and inspiring all these British acts to kind of take it. And then you got the British blues boom with the likes of Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Yardbirds, Jeff Beck, all them lot. But in Europe, in places like Germany, there was a pushback on the blues. They didn't want it. And I don't know if you know this, Felipe, but I've only recently found this out, having studied the history of power metal, that there was a pushback, man. They didn't want blues in Europe, where it's sort of in mainland Europe, you know, so we're taking it in England and America, but pushing it back in Europe in favour of classical music. And because this that would be more European, maybe. Say again? Because that's more European. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, getting rid of that foreign blues that's coming in. Um, but this is why the power metal has its origins in Europe, you know, places like Germany and Sweden, because there was a pushback on the blues, which I just found really interesting. And having a British band like Rainbow t obviously taking classical influences, despite there being such a huge basis for blues 
I think is a testament to Richie Blackmore's own knowledge, his songwriting and his influences. Um, and you can kind of see why this album stands out among, you know, among many others as being a basis for the origins of power metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's I'm I'm very curious about this because uh, you know I'm not a metal guy, so I don't listen to, to really really heavy rock. So, yeah. which bands can be considered power metal? Um, well, there's, there's there's quite a there's there's quite a um, uh, what's the word a crossover? You know, you've got a lot of bands who could fall into both camps if you like. Um, I'd say the one I know most well is Dragon Force. Have you heard of them? Right. I've Have heard, you heard of them, but never listened to any of them. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's just very fast. You've got symphonic bands as well. Um, do you know what? Let me just, because I'm not, let me just find some your typical power metal bands. Um, so bands, yeah, Dragon Force, bands called Blind Guardian. Have you heard of them? Yes. yes yeah, I Blind Guardian, yeah, okay. Halloween, Nightwish, but Nightwish can be called to be more symphonic, you know. Do you do you, do you generally have a sound in your head when you when you Felipe when you hear the term power metal? Do you have Let's a sound? Say, I don't know. Now that you've mentioned Blind Garden, that then that's more like that's a very good example, Blind yeah. Garden. And they they very... do write about medieval and 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 kind of they do they uh, wrote a whole album on uh, Lord of the Rings themes exactly stuff. okay um, okay so it's Lord of the Rings is something that came to my mind when I <laughs> there you the go album. but the characteristics I explained of power metal keep them in your mind faster songs lighter and more uplifting but still heavy fantasy lyrics and themes symphonic and classical instrumentation anthemic choruses and bigger emphasis on keyboards that's kind of what you're looking at with power metal and bands like Halloween, Nightwish, uh, Sabaton, Man of War. They kind of exude that power metal vibrancy, if you like. It's interesting. So, because like Iron Maiden's got some of those characteristics, but no keyboards. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, maybe, right. the, maybe the choruses are not like as um, relevant to the song as as the, the riffs are, whatever. And- and with heavy metal, you know, I'm if, if I don't know if um, I know you know, but I don't know if any of our listeners know. I, I also run a heavy metal channel, a YouTube channel with my wife called Minds of Metal. And what's been evident since we've been doing the channel for about six months now, what's been evident is how how unnecessary some of these subgenres in heavy metal are. Like I said, parcel metal. You know, I, I get things like black metal because that's something in its own. But there's things like post grunge black metal. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, yeah. I Melodic, think I think heavy metal is punk influence. Yeah. You know, <laughs> probably heavy heavy metals is the, is the genre with uh, the most subgenres ever, isn't it? Like you it's just, it's, just so, yeah. it's it's ridiculous. There's too much. I mean, or, or or it's just people trying to find labels for stuff, isn't it? I still well, just I, think, uh, yeah. I just perceive everything as heavy metal because it's not um it's not my favorite kind of music, so I probably don't know that much about it. Yeah. So I couldn't tell the differences. But um, but I can clearly tell that all of that is somehow present in this album, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, are you all right for me, for, for me to take a few minutes and to just place this in the heavy metal history? Yeah, please. Cool. No, you need to school me on that because that's like... <laughs> well, this is my bread and butter. I've been studying heavy metal for the best part of 10 to 15 years and it all comes down... With, well, just so you know, guys, this is one of my favourite albums ever. Oh, and actually, right. the first half of the album is really good. You know, I like the songs, but for me, it all lies in the second half of the album, Stargazer and the Light in the Black, but I'll get to that later. Right. So here's the important stuff. From 1970, February 13th, you've got Black Sabbath who released Black Sabbath. Whether they or fans or whoever calls it hard or heavy or doom rock, whatever, whatever you thought it was back then, it did start heavy metal. So in the first five years you've got the first wave of heavy metal. Now, these are bands like Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, uh, Uriah Heep, Budgie, Atomic Rooster, all playing. Now, this is an interesting aspect. There is one critic, a gentleman called Martin Popov, who I've been studying a lot of his works recently. He thinks that heavy metal is when rock music has the blues taken out of it. Ah. So when you take the blues out of hard rock, you're left with heavy metal. And if you listen to the Black Sabbath's first album, I think that's evident to hear. 
Now, in these first five years, from 1970 to 75, you are going to have crossover. There are, go you know, just think about Machine Head by Deep Purple. That's 1972, I think. Now, Pictures of Home, for me, that's a heavy metal song. No blues, dissonance throughout, drum solos, bass solos, you know, all these crazy heavy stuff. But then you've got songs like, um, what is it? Somebody, somebody, do, 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 do. Um, never, never before never from before. Machine Head, yeah. yeah. That's a kind of funky record. blues song. So I'm not saying that everything Deep Purple did after 1970 was heavy metal, but some characteristics, some elements were there. 1971, Fireball by Deep Purple, the first use of double kick drums in rock and roll music. Yeah, the song and Fireball. You, yeah, you tell me yeah. if I'm wrong with that, and maybe you can talk no. later because I want to talk to well, you later. It's at least the first well-known song. Exactly, yeah. 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 Sometimes it's okay. really hard to claim that was it. Because, like... Uh, um, Funny or not, the, the double kick thing was was around in jazz music, you know. So yes, uh, Chick Webb, Louis Belson, Louis Belson used to, to play with two kicks, but uh, in a heavy rock context, uh, Ian Pace was the first one to do, it. and he wasn't even like uh, uh, probably not really keen to 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 use that as a uh, as part of his style. So he would play just that one song with two kicks and that was it yeah and and uh, they would bring a kick on stage <laughs> i've seen the vhs I, I i had a vhs that's how old i am uh <laughs> deep purple uh playing live and um so they would bring an extra kick to the stage and like set it up just for that song yeah. just for fireball but yeah yeah that's that became typical of of uh um heavy rock isn't it that's isn't right it? yeah so you've got these elements that sabbath were bringing in you know the dissonance the minor scales the dark lyrics the doominess about it um these were well, this is what was happening between 70 and 75 now from 1980 i'm going to skip the five years for now 1980 you've got the birth of the new wave of british heavy metal which is where heavy metal became cemented it's where people, audiences, weren't just saying, oh, is this hard rock? Is this heavy metal? What's heavy? What's rock? What's metal? What You know, this is where we, we learn what metal was, because you have bands like Angel Witch and Iron Maiden, uh, Motorhead, Saxon, all spearheading this heavy metal movement. And we weren't just talking about heavy metal as a music. Oh, well, it's got bubble kicks. It's got dual guitars. You're talking about the look as well. Them dressing up in leather, associating it with biking, you know, uh, spandex and tight. You know, I know we associate that more now with glam metal, but Iron Maiden always wore those tight spandex leggings. Um, and on top of this, so, and after that, that's when metal was cemented as a piece of music history. And from the new wave of British heavy metal, it, it just erupts from, from uh, we call it Nwobum to short. From Nwobum, you've got glam, uh, you've got progressive metal beginning, you've got thrash metal beginning. From thrash metal, you've got death metal. From this, you've got that. It all just flourishes. So the new wave of British heavy metal is the pivotal moment in heavy metal history, because after that, when bands started uh, when audiences and bands started realizing that this was what metal was, people just took it wherever they wanted. Now, the key factor is the five years I missed in between 70 to 75, the first wave of heavy metal, uh, 79 to 84, the new wave of British heavy metal. Those four years in between is where you had the second wave of heavy metal. And this is bands Judas Priest, Thin Lizzy, Rainbow. UFO. Now, what these guys were doing, you know, some people might be shocked if, to hear the words Thin Lizzy, but Thin Lizzy, although they played their their sort of, well, they they did their R&B, didn't they? You know, we did an episode on them. They did their R&B in the vocals. They did some poppy stuff. They did some rock stuff. Thin Lizzy. They had all the, had, they had all the guitar harmony bits. Exactly. And that's exactly. what makes them. Dual you know, lead guitars. Now, this is when one guitar plays a melody and another guitar harmonizes it or plays it in unison. But the fact of the matter is, is you've got two guitars and Thin Lizzy were huge, hugely part, you know, were huge in bringing that to the forefront of rock music. And it became a staple uh, characteristic of heavy metal. You know, Iron Maiden, their first album, from their first album onwards, nearly every song has two guitars harmonizing at some point. Now, yeah. Thin Lizzy, Judas Priest, and Rainbow were doing this. And what's crucial about those five years is that heavy metal could have stayed how it was with what Sabbath did. Short songs, satanic lyrics, dark dissonant chords, guitar riffs mainly, you know, not really many solos, but bits and pieces here and there. But bands like Priest 
uh, well, again, in my in my YouTube channel with my wife, we just did a um, a reaction, and I think we've got we're going to be doing it in a few months as well. So that's another one you got to you got to look out for, Felipe. Called "Sad Wings of Destiny" by Judas Priest, which is their transition from blues rock to heavy metal, and that's a fantastically important album. And what I have to say about that, I'm going to wait until we do the episode because I don't want to give anything away. But Judas Priest doing that, and Rainbow doing this bringing in the classical influences, expanding song lengths, using unusual scales and chords, um, production, fantasy lyrics. This is all what they were doing. They took the traditional elements of metal from Sabbath, from Deep Purple, and they embellished it. They added sections to it, and they said, this is what metal could be. And because of bands like Rainbow and Priest, you've got that link between Sabbath in 70 and Iron Maiden in 80, you've got the link, the missing link in the evolution of metal of why bands went from that dark, doomy, slow sound to something that could be fast, punky, full of instruments, energetic, like Iron Maiden. Interesting. Wow, man. That's a, that's a hell of a lesson on heavy metal. Thank you. I've, <laughs> I've really, been stunning really... my ass off the last few I... years of this, you know. I know, I know. And it's so cool to understand this in context because I, I was actually uh, uh, thinking about asking you this question how does rainbow and this album specifically sits in in the history of of uh, of heavy rock which you yeah. just you just replied to but uh, yeah. just gave me the whole the whole thing the whole picture but now think about let's talk about the the main members of the band the, the songwriters uh blackmore and deal how does rainbow uh, uh, I don't know uh, how is how how is that band? Um, I don't know how does it become part of the the his the personal history of those guys. That's what I'm. I what's the role well, of that band in the personal uh, journey of those musicians? Because Dio, for me, uh, and let me tell you that I'm not a big fan of heavy rock, like really heavy rock. Yeah, but man. What a singer. Yeah. He's just an absolute legend. He was the, in my opinion, by far the best heavy metal singer. That's Technically, I, I, yes. We, once we've discussed there's some elements of of uh, some of, of, of his uh vocal uh um techniques remind me of Fred Fred Mercury because it's it's just like uh yeah. I don't know. He he could be singing in a band like Queen, but he he yeah. could also be uh, Iron Maiden singer. Uh, he well, could he could be in any band, and he was a member when he joined Black Sabbath and did uh, um, the live album Live Evil. His vocal performance is just amazing. And I'm a big Aussie yeah. fan, so it's really hard to accept those songs with any other voice. And it's not a technical comparison because technically Dio is amazing, but it's not that. They just sound really so hard. different. It's really hard to make someone else's music your own. Yeah. yeah. And here's the thing about him. He was a true professional musician. Yeah. He knew exactly which techniques to use. He was always prepared. He could always deliver. I don't think there's a single live recording or studio recording where his voice is not like 100% amazing. Yeah. And that, that's something remarkable, especially uh, in a time that, you know, people would wouldn't have the resources that we have nowadays to re-record stuff a million times <laughs> yeah and 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 do auto tunes and all that stuff um so there's there's a uh, an interesting point about this uh the drummer Cosy Powell uh said in an interview that the whole album was pretty much recorded with one or two takes per song plus a few overdubs like an extra guitar you know or an extra backing vocal whatever but That's uh, crazy. it's basically a band playing the songs and start your finishing studio. Uh, and we talked about this a million times, man. It's crazy, so it? it's... much more like rock and roll uh, when you play with your bandmates, start your finish, get to the end of the take as if you were doing it live on stage. And I, I and I was impressed to, 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 to read that, uh, um, that comment by, by Cosa Paolo because I thought they, they pretty much did like bit by bit, but it's just, what an amazing, amazing album, considering that they recorded pretty much live. 
Well, it, it's the, the the performance by each musician is fantastic, isn't it? And to have the execution to to to, to pull that off in one or two takes per song is phenomenal, especially when you think of the intricacies of the final two songs. Um, but to go back to your question about Dio and Blackmore and about their legacy, we know what Dio did after this. You know, he went and joined Black Sabbath and he released Heaven and Hell with Black Sabbath, which is a fantastic album. And the thing, you know, when, when a band changes vocalist, you know, the, the vocalist is the focal point of any band. Um, yeah. You know, we can love instrumentation as much as we want, but what matters really is the vocals. So you get it, you get times where it doesn't work. You get it where Bruce Dickinson left Iron Maiden and Blaze Bailey came in. Now, Blaze Bailey's voice wasn't different enough. So no, there, there is a first one. We, you got Paul Diano. Now, Paul Diano was very punky. He, you know, the... Uh, trying to keep this next metal lesson short. Uh, the new wave of British heavy metal war took the traditional metal elements as well as the stuff that I said through the 70s, but also added punk into it. That's why if you listen to a song like Prowler by Iron Maiden, you hear the punky vibe. And Paul Diano's vocals were really punky and they worked. It was like, wow, getting through the sea, look, you know, gritty, kind of pubby, growly, gruff, raspy. Then that's you know bands like rainbow showed that you can actually put a proper voice into heavy metal music which is what then when i made and changed to bruce dickinson and the difference between bruce dickinson and paul diano was huge in terms of how they sound but the difference between bruce dickinson and blaze bailey wasn't big enough blaze bailey had a good voice but it wasn't as he, he couldn't reach the high notes as well as bruce dickinson whereas with ozzy and dio the difference is night and day you've got a guy who Right, can Ozzy sing? That's a whole episode in itself. Um, but yes, yeah. he can sing, you know, he, he can sing, but Dio is a powerhouse of a vocalist. And for me, there was no problem when Dio joined the band. I, I act like I was there in 1980. But looking back at it now, the, the voices are so different that it doesn't matter. Well, it, but it, it, I think Sabbath with, with Dio is a different band. And I, I yes. love the fact yeah. it's a completely different band. But I think with Rainbow, he he proved to the world that he could work with uh, uh, a big name like Blackmore, yeah, and actually do uh, start a super group and get results. And, yeah, exactly. And and and, and I, I'm really really amazed by the by the quality of the songwriting in the album. The, my first impression was like, oh, the lyrics are a bit silly, aren't they? I mean, because it's not <laughs> the kind of. Uh, yeah. But uh, but so what is storytelling? As soon as I started imagining the scenes, uh, you know, pictured by the, 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 those lyrics, I thought, you know what, that makes sense. Because mm, uh, yeah. I was like, the, uh, uh, I just want to talk about. I want to talk about the first song. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, Tarot Woman. Uh, I love the fact there's like a minute and and maybe a few more seconds of keyboard intro. It's like, <laughs> yes. where where are we going with this? So there's a, there's a, there's that tension, there's the the you know build up to something, and uh, uh, so you have a solo that is like melodic uh, rather than than fast. So a guitar solo that's not. Again, I was expecting. The whole album to start like fast paced, heavy with um, a really fast guitar solo full of notes and classical music influences. And no, it's like mysterious <laughs> keyboard intro and lyrics about this woman who's going to predict this guy's future. Yeah. And uh, I love the fact that he's, it, it, there's a part where she's, uh, she's talking about the partner that this guy is going to find that's going to carve away his life. So it's like, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. like, be aware of something that's going to happen to you. So it's actually picturing something that is not happening yet. And yeah. you can imagine what, what is this woman doing to this guy in a future that hasn't happened yet. It's just yeah. there. And it's like, so yeah. It, and the, and the way deal delivers that makes you believe in the story. That's why when I started reading the lyrics, was like oh, a bit silly. And then with his dramatic, angry voice on, you know, <laughs> delivering those lyrics, I, I thought, oh, wait a minute, I, I believe this, you know. Yeah, he, and that's the kind of singer he is, isn't he? He just, he can make you believe anything he sings. Isn't it? And Yeah, exactly. And and what makes him such a special singer is, is the fact that most technical singers can't deliver emotion. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes when you're too technical and too good, and everything you think is just perfect, that's what it is. It's perfect. It's not necessarily good or emotional or you know or intense. Yeah, it's just correct. And he's he, he exactly. goes beyond being correct or singing the right stuff. Yeah, and he actually delivers the anger and and the uh, the passion, and the drama, and the passion that comes yeah. with the lyrics. Really, really cool. The the um, yeah, it, it is. I love I love Tower Woman, and um, one of my favorite things is how much Iron Maiden I can hear. Tarot woman, dun, 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 the galloping. Dun, yeah. dun, dun. But the other note I've made of Tower Woman, and this to me is uh, an unsung hero of the album. That on your first, well, maybe not you, but on on a, on a majority of first listens, this could um, pass you by because Dio's vocals are at the forefront. But drums on this album. Uh phenomenal there are fills everywhere and that is what actually leads me to believe or sort of influences me to think that this is more of a metal album than a rock album because the drums are just going so crazy there's fills everywhere and they're so good aren't they they're good uh, again um because of power is an extremely technical musician so right, okay uh, you can clearly see that there are um Blackmore was looking for that kind of of musician to have as bad. Is this, right? Sorry, is this the same Cozy Powell that played Emerson Lake and Powell? Yes. Wow. Same Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredibly technical to play with Emerson <laughs> and Lake, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. You got to be, but you know, very different uh, if you compare to Carl Palmer, because Carl Palmer has a lot has a lot more jazz. Yeah, uh, even a little bit of country. Where did Powell come yeah. from? Did he have a rock background or blues or uh, Powell? Yeah. I think that, I think the, that there's uh believe me or not even classical music in his background because I I've, I've oh. seen a performance of him playing like uh, uh like pl- classical music melodies on on the drums and stuff like that. He, yeah. He, yeah, his solos were really melodic and again very technical and um the thing is he really smashes the drums but it's so precise and so clean that none of his fills sound like overplaying. Yeah. Never. How do you, how and do you again, rate the drum performance on this album. Sorry, man. How, how do you rate the drum performance on this album, and what impact does it have on the album for you? Uh, I, to start with, it's flawless. I mean, I think his drumming is just yeah, um, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's just flawless. Every single feel, every single groove has a place. Again, the drum intro for or Stargazer. Uh, it's a, well, if you think as half tempo is four bars, but you can, I, I feel it as a double tempo intro so it's an eight bar yeah um drum intro using every single drum and a hi-hat and it's like <laughs> and it's but it's it's very like it's tasteful it kind of it? swings a little bit less than a guy than guys like ian pace and bill ward who were okay. doing that kind of music before so he swings a bit less okay so it means it's less jazzy and bluesy yeah it's more rocks more like a. uh uh, uh it, it that's why maybe ah that's maybe that answers your question maybe the fact that he's more precise and more straight uh instead of swinging on every phrase and groove maybe that's what makes him um important to the history of heavy metal from from that point onwards because that's a great point he's yeah. more he's more his playing is more metronomic let's put it like that he's is is a machine in a good way let's say mm, a machine yeah. with a heart um, and 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 also the, the one thing about him, he used to play live with um, gigantic drum kits, loads of toms and cymbals, deep drums, like loud and heavy. And the big drum kits were a thing and were really important to the, the history of heavy heavy rock as well. So yeah. I mean, you you can't uh, you can't praise him enough for for his musical qualities. Cosi Powell, one of the best rock drummers of all times, mm. for sure. That's really cool. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic performance. Do you have anything to say about the other three tracks on the first half of the album? Because I just wanted to say that actually, do you know what? This, they do all have their own identity and they do have their own uh, distinct sound. But Run With The Wolf and Starstruck, they both sound kind of Deep Purple-esque to me, especially Starstruck because it's quite swung and bluesy, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah. The, I, would, I would agree with you that the second... The <laughs> Yeah, the, the two songs in the second half of the album are actually 
okay. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Two songs on the end of the first half of the album. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm talking about the uh, the second half is only two. You're two talking about songs. Stargazer and A Light in the Black. Exactly. Cool. All right, those okay. two songs, I'm pretty sure those are your favorites, and I want you to talk about them more than me. Fine, yeah. I, I would but gladly accept that. So you let take me the talk first about half. the first ones because <laughs> knowing my taste, you're not going to be surprised to hear that I prefer the first half. Yes, and yeah, I prefer, yeah, I guess. And that. I prefer those first four songs. Um, well, we talked, we, we spoke enough about Tarot Woman, and mm -hmm. then Run with the Wolf. Uh, there's a line in the lyrics that is like, uh, there's a hole in the sky, something evil is passing by. So, that you know, that's the yeah. that's the, the connection between the two sides of the album, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. it's, it's the uh, fantasy lyrics and all that stuff. But the playing, as you said, is it, it does remind a lot of the old Blackmoor, um, Deep Purple vibe. It all so, feels a bit more loose, doesn't it? It does. It does. If if it, well, it feels like he's in control, so he's having more fun. <laughs> yeah. But like Star Starstruck um, does have a, some of the classical uh, um, elements on the opening riff, mm -hmm. which is super cool. And uh, and the opening riff is a big statement on that song, in my opinion. And it has a shuffle feel, which you could hear in uh, Black Knight by Deep Purple. Same, yeah. same sort of vibe. So it's nothing new. So I get it why the second half is more important, more relevant to to, to the mm. history of rock, because there's nothing uh, uh, completely new on the first half. Mm. So uh, Starstruck's classic uh, 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 Blackmore. The interesting thing is the story behind the lyrics is a real story about a fan that was that was uh, who was stalking him. Uh, you know, literally. Um, hiding herself in his backyard and uh, like and <laughs> yeah and turning up at any time of the day at his door asking for a photograph asking for like she was a french girl who who started coming to gigs and uh and dio mentioned in an interview that the last time they saw her um uh, she was like in the front row of a gig in paris and as usual blackmore broke his guitar in pieces smashed his guitar into pieces pieces and one of the pieces hit her in her forehead and that was like the last time they saw her oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know i don't know how much we hurt her with that but she never turned up again um i don't know if that was intentional it's yeah, not clear. exactly yeah <laughs> the, the fact is i i so what i like about that because i'm not really into the uh, fantasy side of of lyrics and stuff like that i like the fact that they this this song is kind of saying oh you know sounds funny that someone's behaving like that but i'm quite scared of it yeah. so it's a real real life story something that happened to the band and and i love when a songwriter can write about something that happened to someone else mm, so yeah. blackmore told dio the story or they were gigging together and, and that happened and they, and dio wrote the lyrics based on blackmore's experience and i love mm. that i think it's a it's a, it's a fun and uh, kind of dramatic story at the same time also, and it's, it's, it's what I like the most about it it goes to show how how well Dio can interpret what Blackmore's asking of him isn't it yeah yeah I mean I, I'm I'm more and more amazed by by Dio and I think um you know I think I should have spent a lot more time in my life listening to his stuff <laughs> it's like <laughs> I'm really impressed well you got to I, check all out. my all my friends in my home town they in my hometown, all my heavy metal. Sorry, hmm? sorry. What, what, no, no, yeah, yeah mo most of the guys I was hanging out with, uh, uh, you know, back in the day, my hometown, they were into heavy rock. Also, was into classic rock, right? And and right. And, and other stuff, but lighter stuff. Let's put it yeah. like that. So you Soft were missing stuff. out on this stuff. Yeah, I was missing out. Everyone's like, "Oh, dear, it's amazing." This is yeah, hey, yeah, whatever, whatever. I, I never, I never gave that much attention. But obviously, <laughs> when I the, the the field tracks I've heard with his voice really impressed me but i think i should have digged uh, i think digging deeper into his catalog is something i definitely need to do well felipe you've done exactly what the intention of this show is <laughs> <laughs> you've proven it we were people like you who have listened to nearly every band every rock band under the sun yet you haven't quite yet discovered rainbow you've just found a new band and yeah exactly I'm going to do a, a, a quick, um, a quick segment. We'll do a quick feed the drummer. All right. And what I'm going to give you is Rainbow's next album called Long Live Rock and Roll, which is what the name of this podcast is based on. <laughs> but they're all they're not. There's no stargazers or light in the blacks. There's no eight and a half minute epics. They're mostly songs just like the first half of this album. 
So you all right. Go and check. If you love the first half of this album, you're going to love Long Live Rock and Roll. Um, um, we'll put, we'll put um, one of the songs from that in the playlist. Um, please do. Just to take to take the opportunity. Uh, uh, so the the fourth song is exactly yeah. a straightforward rock song. Yes. Yeah. Do you close your eyes? Is a song about sex, and that's it. <laughs> there's nothing. There's no like a. Uh, 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 I don't know. There's no. There's. There's nothing. Uh, 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 they're not hiding anything in the lyrics. There's nothing special yeah. about the song. Is a rock and roll song about sex, and that's it. Do you close yeah. your eyes? That's it. And and mm. it's and it's uh, one of the shortest songs in the, if uh, one of the if not the shortest uh, song in the album, isn't it? Mm. I think it is. Um, it is. A, I, I've got um, my notes say just ACDC style. You know that those chords. Like da na 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 da na na da da, you know, just like chords yeah, yeah. in the main riff. I can hear ACD saying that. Yeah, it's two minutes and fifty eight seconds, so it's Pretty really cool. short for an album like this. And what a contrast from yeah. this to the songs you you're going to talk about now, isn't it? There we go. Yeah, it is. It is a. It is a. It is an album of two halves, quite literally. Um, so Stargazer. Now, the reason I'm going to talk about this in a bit of depth is because of what I think it's done for metal. Now, there is personal bias here because this is one of my favourite metal albums and Stargazer might well be one of my favourite ever songs, ever. Top oh, wow. 10, ever. I love this song with all of my heart. Um, first of all, the drum intro, as you said, you know, before falling into that excuse me such a heavy doomy haunting riff that comes in and you've got to think about the scale that they do before uh the vote the verse so classical. I don't even know what scale that is, and I don't want to know. But the technicality and the precision, as you said, for all of them to have been on playing that exact scale perfectly before falling into the main verse is fantastic. Yeah, here's one um, of the things. Without, without all the editing that we're doing more than recording, to actually play unisons or harmonies as the keyboards and guitar were playing uh, and recording them live, playing together, like, it's just... It's ridiculous they achieved that quality and that yeah. accuracy. You know, it's insane. Um, check out the, the pre-chorus. It goes, um, oh, I see his face. Where was your scar? Listen to the vocals because he's singing very minor. Now, this is why I'm talking about heavy metal. I'm talking about minor chords, minor vocal lines, dissonance, you know, not pleasant to the ear. And then behind those vocals, you've got the haunting keyboards. Just listen to what what is it uh, Tony Kerry listen to what Tony Kerry's doing behind the vocals and the pre-chorus because it's just it adds a texture that if you don't focus you don't even know it's there chorus is fantastic heavy rhythms dun 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 um then we get all of that repeated again and then you've got the solo now the solo is fascinating in my opinion because he's playing there's something crazy oh what was it it's um it's a B Phrygian dominant scale. Now we're not going to go into what that means. Basically, in rock music at this time, even metal in this time, you're talking about using pentatonic scales, blues scales, major scales, minor scales, maybe harmonic minor scales, just a variation of that. To go into the world of modes and altered scales like a B Phrygian dominant, that's where Blackmore's classical influence came in. And I think you can hear it obviously on this solo. Um, unusual scale choices, Mid Middle Eastern, you know, a huge factor of heavy metal music was the Middle Eastern sound, which was pioneered by Dick Dale. We'll put the song um, Mizirlu that he did in, uh, because that's uh, uh, that's the oh, one, that's that, great one. You know the one, don't you? Yes, we'll put that in the playlist. He, he really brought in distorted guitar playing Middle Eastern scales because it's unusual. Um, minor scales, guitar shredding as well. We're hearing early examples of guitar shredding. Don't forget, three years after this album, Eddie Van Halen does Eruption. So we're still not quite at shredding yet, yet we can hear Blackmore playing really fast licks towards the end of this solo. Um, and then there's nothing really metal about the ending, but I just have to say it because I love it. The improvisational, well, it's not really improv, the, the, the repeats at the end where Dio is just vamping it's like, my eyes are bleeding and my heart is leaving. Place I know. And he just goes crazy on it. Man, I get goosebumps. I, you can't see on the camera, but I get goosebumps just because 
I've ne- you, you said it yourself. You said his vocals put through so much emotion, so much passion. And I'm just imagining him as one of the humans having been forced to work for this wizard, building a tower. You don't know why you're doing it. All you know is that you've got a dictator telling you, you've got to do this. But yet there's also wonder about it. There's what, what's he going to see when he gets to the top of the stout tower? Like that, that, may, maybe that's what makes it, uh, that's what relates this song to Tyro Woman. Because it's like, it's giving you half of the story. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's like, Okay, it builds builds up all that tension about something that's going to happen, and as absurd as the whole story is, as as you know, uh, 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 it's fantasy, but it makes you it makes you believe through his delivery that that yeah. story is actually happening, and it doesn't give you the ending most of the time. It's like, yeah. okay, that's the story, and you you know you know make up your own ending for it, or or keep exactly. thinking about it. So I'll be thinking about this album for days now because it's like, <laughs> you know, what happened to that wizard? What's going on? So and and, well, it, and 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 what happened to the guy who who is yeah. about to meet a partner partner who's going to mess up with his life? Exactly, a woman. So well, it, what's going on? You know, we are we are given some form of ending when yeah. we go to the next song because a light in the black lyrically is a sequel to Stargazer. As I said earlier, it tells uh, yeah. the story of the humans after the wizard dies. Now, go, going to the musical elements of a light in the black. Um, the first thing I noticed is in the intro and the solo, the kick pattern. That is just, it's like Fireball, isn't it? Just double yeah. kicks, which I is think it's a double kick there, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. is. And uh, uh, again, very heavy and very fast. So exactly. not many drummers were doing exactly that at the time. Very heavy, very fast. The rhythm and notes in the during the solo, the same thing, very heavy. Uh, again, unusual scales in chord progression in solos. Now, uh, my final point about this song is the dual lead instruments. Now, a staple characteristic of Thin Lizzy was the dual lead guitars. And from metal, from Iron Maiden onwards, it was dual lead guitars. Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Metallica, even nowadays, you've got bands like Trivium, Avenged Sevenfold, all of them utilizing two guitars. But it's interesting here that we've got the keyboard and the guitar sharing the um, the melodic line, playing in harmony. And yeah, like that's that. that's a unique that. feature of this band, isn't it? Or, yes, I mean, it is, yeah. Or, or, or of or maybe of the bands that Blackmore was, was a member of, because he didn't want, I think he didn't want a second guitar player. He wanted a, a keyboard player, Yeah, which which is a, I think it's a much nicer contrast when you're harmonizing, in my opinion. You know, uh, if you have one layer of guitar and one layer of keyboards instead of many guitars, I think it's just different. I like it. Yeah. But that that's it. That, that's my, that's sort of my analysis of the second half of the album. And you've done your part of the first. It's just, yeah, this, I, I can't. The, I just love this album, man. And do you know what? I do like the first half of the album, but as I said at the start of the episode, for me, all of most of my love for this album is those final two songs, which makes sense. I'm a metalhead. I love. Yeah, them. yeah. But do you know? Do you know? Do you know what surprised me with Stargazer, but not being a metalhead. That, yeah. That's that's what why the album is unbelievably good because a lot a light in the black is. It does remind me a lot of Iron Maiden. It's fast. Yeah. There's kind of room for everyone to shine, right? Yes, yeah. There's every every musician is showing their skills in that song. Uh, and, you know, the keyboards are harmonized with the guitars. That's great. Yeah. But Stargazer, for me, is more surprising because A Light in the Black, although it was, you know, there's innovation for the time, but you have loads of bands doing it. What makes a Stargazer special for me is the pace of the song. It's yeah, a yeah. medium slow groove, which mm-hmm. is not common in more than heavy metal. Most of heavy metal songs, in my opinion, I mean, the ones I know, are, um, are well known for being fast. So it's always yeah. like fast and loads of notes. The fact that the groove is kind of is, has a half half tempo vibe leaves a lot more room for long vocal notes. Mm. So I think the bass and the drums of that song specifically, they 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 really provide the the, the uh, perfect background for Dio to shine and, yeah. and show all his vocal interpretation and technique. So I think it's Stargazer is um, the most important song of the album. Yeah, fantastic stuff, man. I mean, do you have anything else to say about the album uh, before we finish up? Uh, just just what I usually say, you, you guys got to listen, listen to it. it. If you don't know, go listen. if you have listened to it in the past, listen to it again. I love it when I ask you your questions. Like, do you have anything to say? I go listen to it. 
<laughs> yeah, just go and listen to it. I'm, I'm there like, yeah, if you like this album, go and check out this song. And, th- and you're like, I'd go listen to it. Go and listen to it. Have fun, you know. You know um, open one quick question before I do my monologue. Yeah. What do you think is rock and roll about this album? Oh, my God. What is rock and roll about this album? Wow. Uh can I just say you shouldn't be surprised because I ask you this at the end of every episode and you're always like, oh, oh it's difficult. It's so much I, I find this the hardest question ever. I should I should think of this before every time. You know the way I do my monologue? You do this, all right? From now on, when I plan my monologue, you've got a plan. I need to plan yeah. for me saying to you what's rock and roll about this. Yeah. I th- okay. I think it's the uh, uh the perfect balance between uh fantasy and reality. Great. And- Groove and heaviness, brilliant. Yeah, and, and for the time that was quite useful. solos and melodies. That's the balance that makes this album really rock and roll. Brilliant. That was great, man. Yeah, fantastic. Good answer. Good answer. Um, time for my monologue then. Um, before before the monologue, I'll talk quickly about the album cover. How cool is the album cover? Ah, uh, because oh, there's a rainbow got, in it. You've got a rainbow with a hand crushing it. In <laughs> It's in a backdrop that looks like hell with mountains and red clouds and everything. It's so cool, isn't it? It's it's so like uh, uh, typical in a certain way of like heavy metal, you know. Uh, and, um, until you see the rainbow in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then that hand grabbing the rainbow is like, nah, nah, let's take this away. So, and and I think the, uh, the 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 colors of the rainbow are, are so interesting in in the context of of heavy rock because rainbow for me uh, is happiness is is like exactly it's 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 light it's you know being happy whilst heavy metal sometimes tends to be really dark so i think the idea of rainbow as a band is uh, maybe maybe it has to do with the the concept of the band we're not just dark and evil you know but yeah, yeah but there's loads of darkness and evil in it anyway excellent right so we'll finish off with my monologue as usual so here we go Uh, In the mid-70s, metal stopped being just about Black Sabbath and a few others, heavy guitars and dark dissonant music. It expanded and lyrically it became about fantasy, wizards, castles. Musically, it expanded into unusual scales and chord progressions, drawing on influences from classical music as opposed to the blues. Songs became longer, arrangements more complex, instrumentation more diverse, and Rainbow's Rising was one of these albums that is responsible for beginning to open up avenues to what metal could be. Is it hard rock? Is it heavy metal? For me, as a fan of the music, it doesn't matter. But historically, it does matter, as this is an album of two sides, no pun intended. The first half exhibits a great blend of hard rock riffs coupled with a heavy rhythm section and some interesting harmonic choices, as well as the obvious influence of Blackmore's neoclassical compositional fascination. For all the great material in the first half, though, it is the second half of Rising which cements this album into the metal history books. Stargazer is an eight-minute long epic full of unorthodox scales and chords, classically influenced solos, fantasy lyrics about a wizard, heavy rhythms throughout the entire song, doomy keyboards that add so much atmosphere, and the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra to add an incredibly symphonic feel to the end of the song. The sequel, A Light in the Black, continues in the same vein. This time the song is faster, utilises dual lead guitars with heavy emphasis on the double bass drum kick pattern, and the keyboards take a much more central role when it comes to the, again, classically inspired solos. Together, the second half of this album can be said to be responsible for the creation of the power metal subgenre, but more importantly, it is a key part of the development heavy of heavy metal because it took the traditional elements from the early days, then along with the other second wave of metal bands, expanded and broadened its horizons to finally cement what metal was to become in the 80s, and from there, as explained earlier, the rest is history. Yeah, well said, as usual. Thank you. It's, um, I, I can't get over this album, man. I love it. And I'm so glad we finally got to do like one of, well, I say finally got to do one of my favourite albums. Like, I loved every album we've done, but this is a personal one for me because I, 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 I love metal and I love I love the song Stargazer. I love it. I'm really happy with the fact that we'll be doing what we're proposing, you know, uh, with the show, which is like we want people uh, to get to know classic albums and and to understand what they're all about. Exactly. And we're doing we're doing this by challenging each other to get into a new territory <laughs> exactly. and listen to stuff you're not familiar because, with. 
because you're not familiar with this, and because the second half of the album was overly kind of more towards the heavier side, I didn't think you'd like the album. But it's really pleasantly surprised that you did enjoy it. So I'm really glad about that. I mean, I really did, and I, I uh, <laughs> that's the other thing I like about the show is like uh, maybe if I listen to the album a couple of times, that's enough for me to you know take notes and analyze and 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 get professionally prepared for the show. <laughs> yeah, but I just. <laughs> keep going back and listening again and again and again. The drum, the drum intro for Stargaze. I think I've listened to that about twenty five <laughs> times today. It's worth alone. it. It's worth it. It's worth <laughs> it. Anyway, excellent. Well, great place to finish up. So um, thank you again, guys, for joining us for another episode. We hope you've enjoyed this one. Um, As usual, follow us on the socials, please. That's Instagram, Facebook. We're all over those and YouTube as well. Um, Please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you find us, wherever you get us or download us from. Give us a review, please, because it shoots us right up the charts. And it means that, you know, the more people that review it, the more people we are seen by who are just coming across us looking for a podcast about music. And without tooting our own trumpets, we think this is a good show and, we think, and we'd like to be listened to by more people. So a tiny review, 10 seconds of your time would mean the world with us. So thank you again for joining us. Yeah, and if you don't have anything to say, just say, these guys are not shit. That's good enough. That's a review. That's still generally positive, <laughs> isn't it? So, yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> so, yeah, guys, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, and keep on rocking, everyone. And as usual, take care and long live rock and roll. <laughs>